Right, okay, so you can see my name. Um, talking about human development and history lessons from the world uh, museums. Um, in connection with my work, I have to travel quite a lot uh, to different countries. My area of work is the uh, energy sector, uh, research in the energy sector. So um, that is how I travel um, quite a bit. Um, a lot of work that I do is really international sort of um, uh, collaboration with the other organizations research institutes and also um, by universities and industry in Japan and in Europe and so on. I have been working for European Commission for a lot of years and there my job was to, apart from R&D, uh, how to bring the industry and the universities together uh, to do the uh, industry research. Um, so then I, about uh, 24 years ago, I established a company called European Technology Development European because really I was doing mostly uh, European sort of uh, uh, work uh, with the European Commission. Uh, I also um, uh, had founded and running a, um, something called Science, Technology and Development. It was a refereed journal published by Frank Goss in London. Um, then I was invited to join the UK Parliamentary Review uh, Committee and also members of the Leaders' Council of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which is also um, run by the um, UK uh, parliamentary um, parties. So there we, we discuss uh, um, politics, but also science and, and technology as well. And really my emphasis has been um, throughout in all those various activities, apart from the top one, which is uh, just research for industrial purposes. Um, and in the Science, Technology and Development Journal and Leaders' Council, and members of parliamentary review, my emphasis is, emphasis is, is how to um, use the technology for development and also how not to get involved in foreign wars. So one of my, um, really the, I think the advice to the UK, UK parliamentarians has been, is that instead of spending so much money on the wars, um, if we spend even a fraction of that on development, for example, in Afghanistan, uh, we, we could have heard, uh, won the hearts and minds of the, of the people there. And uh, today we will have a, a favorable circumstance uh, rather than replace Taliban with Taliban. So um, to start with, really, I, I'm not a physicist, uh, sorry, I'm not a uh, um, biologist, or uh, I don't have a degree in, in uh, genetics engineering. Um, I'm basically um, a material scientist, uh, but um, I have just interest in basic how the human development took place. And um, I have been sort of, uh, wherever I go, the first thing I do is, or as soon as I find the time, uh, is to visit the museums and try to learn something from there. So this talk will show early human development dating back uh, to four or five million years, to some thousands or hundreds of years, as dated by scientific methods. I will also show some interesting science objects and more recent developments. The evidence from the Great Rift Valley in Ethiopia and Kenya, and I'll show you what Rift Valley is uh, in a minute, to early human settlements in the Philippines, Indonesia, and Northern Europe is absolutely fascinating and overwhelming. How people can live in freezing cold of um, um, climate of, of Northern Europe and, uh, and uh, Northern um, Canada and so on. Yeah, people have been there, um, and it's, for example, in the north of the um, North America uh, for a long time, much before the Europeans uh, went into North America. And in fact, there's the evidence. If you go to um, um, to a museum in Ottawa, you'll see that um, there were literally about 100 million Native Americans living um, in North America, uh, who were mainly wiped out. Um, we all know the history of that. But um, there were peoples actually who, um, even up further in the north, who moved from one end of the um, um, ice sort of, uh, well, maybe on the west of the from, on the west of Canada, north of Canada, uh, right up to um, uh, Scotonovia and so on. Yeah, so they, they, were, they moved for thousands and thousands of mile, miles in, in that frozen weather and lived there. And then I'll talk about uh, um, relatively more recent developments from Egypt, Mohenjo-Daro, 
and Texula, uh, which are evidence of human endeavor and resi resilience. And the rise in, and development of various religious beliefs, that's also very interesting. Um, and they are part of this human endeavor and survival and um, believing, really trying to sort of, um, understand um, uh, what is this all about and what we are all about. All right, so, um, so this is my visit to National Museum of Ethiopia in Addis Ababa. Uh, this is actually very, very interesting. Um, so my tourist guide, Saeed, who's next to me, um, he took me around. Um, it's a, Ethiopia is mainly, as you know, it's an orthodox Christian country, but there are quite a few Muslims there as well, especially um, in Addis Ababa, actually, quite a few Arabs have, have settled there as well. You can see separate sort of um, Arab populations in, but there are many, many native sort of Muslims in that area as well. Say there was one of those. Um, there was another guy with me. They were two together. He was a Christian guy, and you know they told me that they live happily together and they are friend, close friends, and so on. So this is I found this uh, national museum as one of the finest museums, showing the evolution of a man um, a few million years ago. Right. So that's Rift Valley in East Africa. So there are about eight, eight tectonic plates in the world, and then there are about another seven uh, smaller tectonic plates. Some tectonic plates, they move towards each other, and that's how they, can, they, they create mountains and, and so on, yeah. And some of them, they move away from each other. So this particular uh, case, uh, there are a number of rift valleys in, in various places. Uh, in this particular case, the Indian plate and the African plate, they have been moving apart um, this is quite a actually big rift valley going from uh, very north of the um, East African Horn to uh, right up to Mozambique in the, in the south. So in this particular case, um, um, there was a, this rift valley was, found, was formed about 25 years ago, I think 22 to 25 million years ago. Um, and as you can see, the there you can see the, the big surf um, uh, rift between the two, two plates. I'll show you some very interesting example in the next slide. Uh, this is not the Great Rift Valley in East Africa. This is in Iceland. And I have actually crossed this, this particular rift. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so Iceland, Iceland is basically, um, you know, after some time, it will be two different countries rather than one country uh, because the two plates are moving apart at about one centimeter per year rate. The East African Rift Valley is moving, the plates are moving a bit slower, slower about four, four or five millimeter uh, per year. So this one is very interesting that actually, um, apparently, um, well, they have built a bridge there at the other end in the sort of north, as you can see, uh, where the rift is a bit uh, uh, narrow. And uh, one morning, you know, when they take the tourists there, one morning when tourists came, um, the the um, the bridge had actually collapsed, so they had to build another another bridge because uh, you know, the, obviously the plates had moved uh, a bit too further apart. So this is a very good example to show uh, of the uh, how the rift surf occurs and rift valleys valleys formed. So going back to um, to this one, so what happened was that this 25 million years ago, when the two plates moved apart. Um, then a lot of soil fell into there, and the people in that area, they all got buried. So now they are doing the excavation and taking out very old sort of um, um, bones out and dating them and putting to, uh, trying to put the skeletons together, which can take a long time, actually. You know, you find bones of one person, you could probably be spending 15, 20 years doing the research and, and finding bits and pieces and trying to put them together um, and, get, and trying to solve that jigsaw puzzle. So this was a rift valley in East Africa has been a rich source of hominite fossils that allow the study of human evolution. The rapidly eroding highlands quickly fill the valley with sediments, creating a favorable environment for the preservation of remains. The bones of se several hominite ancestors of modern humans have been found here. 
And I'll be talking about the three uh, interesting skeletons which are displayed in the, in this Ethiopia National Museum. Um, one is called RD. RD is 4.4 million years old and the features of both modern day humans, homo sapiens and chimpanzees are found in, in RD. So it's really in between, so if you like, between humans and the chimpanzees. And I'll show you the, uh, some of the bones later um, uh, to show the difference. And the second one was some, someone called Salam. This is how they, um, they spell it, but it's basically Salam as in Professor Abdul Salam. Uh, you know, Salam as a Muslim name. Uh, it's, or it's also in Ethiopia, actually, the, the, the common word of greeting is Salam. It doesn't matter what your religion is, you know, everybody says salam to each other. So salam is 3.3 is million years old and showed further development. So that's about 1.1 1 1 million younger than RD. And the next one is, is Lucy, 3.2 million years old. I found Lucy more, most interesting because they found, I think, um, they could basically put together the whole, um, the whole skeleton uh, of a human being. And this was a fully developed Homo sapien. So you can see the bones of the of RD there. Um, um, the species walked upright on two legs. Its form of bipedalism was quite different from that of modern humans. Researchers think that this represents an early form of upright walking and reveals how apes went from living in the trees to walking on the ground. And I think a lot of time actually people say, um, you know, those who are against the sort of theory of evolution, they say, well, you know, if the chimpanzees developed into humans, then why there are still chimpanzees around, you know? That's a different debate, but obviously not in every area um, animals develop or evolve in the same way as in other areas. So in some areas they evolve, in some areas they don't for different reasons. Um, and then you see Salam, um, which I said 1.1 million years, um, younger than RD, um, and you can see the various sort of skeletons. You can actually see his hands as well, while in the case of um, the other, the hand, sort of the fingers, you know, the bones were not there. Um, according to the researchers, the fossils, uh, the, the, this, was a, um, uh, the, this was a child's uh, um, bones, three-year-old child. According to the researchers, the fossils suggest that the child grew up quickly like a chimpanzee, what was beginning to evolve slower growth patterns like those of modern humans. So it still grew very fast like chimpanzees, but not as, as fast as, as chimpanzees themselves. Um, and the next one will be RD. So in RD actually here, the, this, this uh, um, it's a blue sort of um, part, they are not actual bones. So they have put some of the, you know, the bones together and some artificial sort of, um, structures to make the complete sort of, um, uh, to show the complete uh, skeleton. And uh, so this was 3.2 million years old, as I said before, 1.1 million, um, no, sorry, this is 1.2 million younger than, than uh, RD and about 0.1 million, 100,000 years younger than uh, Salam. And why they uh, named this one Lucy? Simply because apparently the um, the people who are digging the place at that time, digging the place at that time, um, they were playing the music, music Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. It's a Beatles song, very famous one, and they decided to call her, call her Lucy after their song. So the difference, this is the most inter interesting one. You can see the hip sort of bones. So this is the hip bones of the um, of a chimpanzee. These are hip bones of RD, and these are the hip bones of um, um, Lucy. And you can see these hip bones are very different. This is something that, you know, you can't really uh, stand upright and walk. In this one, um, there's an evolution, and you can see the development has taken place. The, the hip sort of bones have become quite different and smaller, and uh, so the person could, could, stay, stand, could stand up. And this with Lucy one, these are very similar to the uh, modern humans. So um, the, the development is, is quite, uh, I think, quite convincing there. 
from chimpanzee to um, uh, start with like half human, half chimpanzee, and this is this, this Homo sapiens of uh, hip joint. So that is really, I think that is so far about um, about that human evolution. The whole talk is not about human evolution. There are other interesting things as well. And this is from Ayala Museum in Philippines in Manila, which I found very interesting as well. And this is about early Philippines history, dates back to 250,000 to 750,000, about quarter of a million to three quarters of a million years ago, when early Filipinos first inhabited the islands. Filipinos are basically a volcanic island. There are a lot of valleys and mountains and so on. And, um, and a lot of evidence has been preserved. So um, archae archaeological evidence shows that people live without the sense of land ownership. They also, there's some evidence which also shows that even at that time, about you know, uh, maybe half a million years ago or more, um, people believed in some sort of um, soul and afterlife. So there was some religious belief had developed as long ago uh, as that. All right, so, so this is what they, they have constructed from that evidence, that people had started building, uh, building houses and so on. Obviously, the Stone Age had, um, had started at that time. Stone Age had started about, I think, two and a half million years ago. So um, and they were very much into Stone Age, and you can see the, um, how they were, they were building sort of land for themselves. Um, and in the valley, um, you know, they, they were making their houses and so on. Um, so that's really what, about uh, half a million years ago. Then more recently, Mohenjo Daro, Babylon, Babylon civilizations, about four and a half thousand, five thousand years ago. Uh, what happened there? Right, okay, this is Mohenjo Daro. Uh, when they, they started, so there was a drainage system and there were some more, much more sophisticated stuff. Uh, um, developments, agriculture, and so on. Um, and this is in Egypt. But actually, the surprising thing I found in Egypt was that um, what you see inside the uh, tombs and so on, uh, when you come out, you see similar agriculture outside as well, still flowing the same way. So this shows that some societies have learned and uh, they have developed, while the others somehow have not been able to absorb the uh, new sort of science age and still are sort of stuck in the same um, uh, systems which, were, which were, had evolved uh, for 5,000 years ago. And I think that is something that for us to you know, learn a lot about that how we need to, to move on, especially with the increasing populations um, and so on. Um, coming even nearer to the time, this is only 400, uh, BC of 2400 um, years ago. In Texas, for example, there's this wall which is built and you can see there, um, there are small stones in between the big stones. And apparently this, this was done because there were a lot of earthquakes in this area. We still have the earthquakes in this area. And they put small stones to absorb the, the shock of the, um, so that the walls and the horses will, will not fall. And as you know, Texala Museum is actually is, a, is one of the very old museums. There's much to learn about the university in Texala, um, you know, where the people actually walked right from Nepal and Bhutan and for thousands and thousands of miles to come there and, and live and, and study. Uh, so there's a lot to, um, to see, you know, even 2,400 years ago, there was this quest for knowledge and for scientific um, development. And the other thing which surprised me in Texala was that there was water distillation system. This is not a true picture. I couldn't really find the true picture, but I have seen it myself there. Um, so even at that time, there was a, a water distillation system, uh, which is, um, seems quite unbelievable uh, for that time. Um, next, I move on to the National Folk Museum of Korea, located within the grounds of the um, Gyeongbok Gang uh, Palace, in basically this is Jongno Jgu um, uh, area of Seoul, uh, the capital of, of South Korea. The palace was built about 600 years ago um, by one, the, the last of Joseon dynasty, because after that uh, the, all the 
emperors had finished, it was occupied by Japan and so on. So um, Joseon dynasty, dynasty came to an uh, end. But the interesting thing was that there was underfloor heating system at that time in the palace. So there was a kind of central heating system which had, um, um, was, had been there for about 600 years ago. And, you know, we all sort of think today that central heating system is something that um, has developed in the modern times and, and uh, through the European sort of um, um, research. It's very interesting. So that is really about the developments from a few million years uh, to more recent. I'll show you, you know, what is happening in the last, next last 20 years or so as well. Um, another thing as human beings, and when I was in Lahore and this certain guy was saying, you know, there was a science mela there, and he was saying the great thing about humans is that they come together like we are doing here. They come together, they socialize, and they exchange ideas and they develop. But unfortunately, the negative thing about humans is that they want to dominate each other. That's in human nature as well, in some ways, and they uh, fight wars. So um, I'll show you a little bit of the, uh, that was the first part was about the human development, and the second part is how they destroy themselves as well. So this is a war remnants museum in, um, in Ho Chi Minh City, in south of Vietnam. Uh, city which was called Saigon. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but this, this is a must-see war museum. It's absolutely, um, I've seen that, you know, the, even the Americans <coughs> there who go for visits and uh, Europeans, uh, they are literally in tears when they see that museum. It's absolutely unbelievable, the horrible sort of uh, things that happened in, in Vietnam. Even the Americans and the Europeans who go there, they can't believe because they have never really, they haven't been told those things. Um, in detail or not, at least for the last sort of, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, they haven't been told much about it or not, nothing is repeated anymore. Um, so this is the, that museum outside sort of, you know, the, uh, the American uh, plans, bomber plans, and the big guns and so on. But the worst thing was that uh, some of the exhibitions, they are too painful to watch. So, um, the weapons of mass destruction, they included Agent Orange, napalm bombs, phosphorus bombs, and all kinds of bombers and large guns were used generously. Uh, the whole villages, families, women, babies, children included were wiped out, stabbed to death, or burnt alive. So this actually happened, and there are a lot of you know, sort of photographs of that. I think there was one sewage pipe. There were three children, they were hiding there. Um, because American soldiers were everywhere. They were looking for all the young men and, and basically shooting them. So they were hiding there. And somehow they were found. They took them out. They were really kind of teenagers, very young. And um, they were all, all three were stabbed to death. And they're still, you know, the photographs were taken. And they are, they are there in the museum. Uh, quite unbelievable uh, things that happen. And even today, children are still born limbless and adults crawl around. So this is not just in Vietnam. In, um, other neighboring countries as well, um, in Cambodia, in Laos, um, still serve similar um, uh, uh, signs and the, and the remnants there. Uh, so really, those war museums is something that we should learn, learn about, uh, but we don't. I mean, recently, USA used mother of all bombs in, on one of the weakest countries in the world, um, in Afghanistan. Uranium depleted shells were used in Fallujah, Iraq, where cancer rate is now much higher than the rest of the country and children are born um, limbless. Maybe one day people of the world, and actually this talk is written mainly, you know, I give this talk in, in, in the UK and in other countries, it's mainly written for them really just to make people aware of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, why these things happen and can we not live in, in peace. Right, so one of the interesting thing is, this, this, was, by the, this was the judgment of the Nuremberg International um, um, Tribunal. It says to initiate a war, of, a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is a supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evils of the whole. And we have ignored all that and we have continued uh, you know, our new wars since then. 
so that was human development, then the human destruction as well of the you know, sort of engaged in destroying um, one another, and the powerful destroying the, the weak ones. Um, and now about the religious beliefs, that's a, uh, and also another very interesting thing how people um, got involved. I showed you one slide where um, I said in the evidence from Philippines is that about half a million years ago, people had sort of started believing uh, in afterlife and uh, uh, some sort of mystics of uh, um, solutions to the world's problem. Um, we have some, indi I told you some indications from the Philippines, what I've said before. We know now that later Egyptians um, and Assyrians as well, um, uh, some of them 4,500 years ago, believed in afterlife and had dug underground tunnels for the afterlife. They had also, in Egyptians actually, they took all the, the golds and other stuff, the kings and princes, you know, they were buried with that so that they, they will need that in, in afterlife. So um, religious beliefs started from there. In fact, there is one idea that the concept of one God started from Egypt because um, pharaohs from the North Egypt um, invaded the, occupied the, um, the South Egypt, which was a different pharaoh, and um, and then they had one pharaoh, and they said there should be one state and one god. Pharaoh was a, was a god, like God. So there should be one state and one god in the, in the world. And apparently this is how in the Middle East the idea of one god started. Although before that, when I said Assyrians, they had their uh, other religions and they had many, many gods. I think about a few hundred gods rather than, rather than one god. Very similar to perhaps uh, Hindu religion. Um, as a part of that, Indonesia, you know, we say Indonesia is the biggest Muslim country in the world in terms of population. Um, Indonesia was not actually always Muslim. It was Hindu and it was Buddhist. Um, and if you go to the uh, Jakarta National Museum, you will see all, everything about Hindu religion um, and uh, ancestor sort of beliefs and ancestral religions before uh, Islam came there. Although there are still some people, in Indonesia is a very big island. I think it's about 70,000, big country, about 70,000 islands. So obviously, because there are different islands, there are different developments have been taken place in terms of religious beliefs as well. So there are still people who believe in various types of religions in Indonesia, and especially in remote island. This is a very famous um, statue of Prajna Paramita, the Buddhist goddess of transcendental Wisdom is a masterpiece of ancient Java art displayed in the treasure room. There are a lot of other things, but this, this is kind of most famous one, so I thought I'll show that in the slide. Um, then I think there's another, in terms of Buddhist religion now, um, uh, there's very famous, very inter interesting um, pagoda that I found, or temples. It's a spiritual and cultural complex of Buddhist temples in North Vietnam. It's not just one temple, but there are a lot of different temples. They're huge, actually. You can walk there for a very long time. And it's very, very um, rich as well in terms of decorations, in terms of gold and so on. The compound consists of the original old temple and a newly created larger temple. It is the largest complex of Buddhist temples in Vietnam and probably anywhere in the world and has become a popular site for Buddhist pilgrims from across Vietnam. Now, it's also very interesting to know that when the religion goes from one area to another area, it changes its shape and its, some of the beliefs and so on, because the old culture that people had, they don't, they don't really just give up, you know, that is there, um, embedded in them. So they adopt the new religion and mix up the two beliefs, if you like, you know. So in this particular case, the actually Buddhism in North Vietnam is quite different from Buddhism in, in South Vietnam. In Buddhism in the North Vietnam came from China, while in the South it came from, from India. So, um, so pagodas, for example, um, are the places of worship in North Vietnam, where temples are dedicated to famous people. Um, in South Vietnam, where Buddhism came from India, temples are the places of worship. Um, here, they are, in North Vietnam, they are uh, dedicated to famous people, while that in the South, and hence the, this difference. So actually, I mean, this happens in Hindu religion as well. Um, and if you go to the south of India, um, there are some of the famous poets or philosophers. They, 
they are also um, regarded as gods. They become gods, and they will not be probably known that well in, in North India. So there is a, um, quite a difference between in different countries, between same religion. So that particular sort of um, uh, set of temples, very rich in, a, uh, as I said before, with the gold and and uh, rich decorations and so on, in North Vietnam. Um, other interesting example really of religions is in, in, in Japan. In Japan, there are two main religions, um, Buddhism and Shintoism. But you know, I, I have uh, quite a few friends in Japan, and one of the professors, he took, he took me to, um, in the north, um, to a city called Senai, sorry, um, um, yeah, to, to one of the cities in the, in the north. And um, we went to Shinto, Shinto Shrine. So what they do is, and he told me, he, sh he was showing me the Shinto Shrine and how the Shinto Shrine basically they're based on ancestor, beliefs of the, in, in, the ancestral ancestors who have died. So um, Sendai, that's, like, that's the city in the north of um, uh, Japan. Sendai, and Sendai was, um, in the old days, was defended by the soldiers. So this Shinto Shrine is dedicated to the soldiers who had defended Sendai. Uh, so when they ring the bell, they go to the, to the Shinto Shrine, ring the bell, and um, spirits of the, the soldiers are supposed to um, come and welcome you, and then whatever wish you have, you, you pray for that. So, um, and this particular professor told me that there's, there are a few Christians as well, very, very few in Japan, and he was a Catholic Christian, but he said, I'm also Shinto and I'm also Buddhist. So he, they practice all three religions. So can you imagine that that's quite interesting, you know, sort of thing that, uh, you know, the same family, uh, basically, um, have, has got three religions uh, as a part of it. In fact, in, the, in uh, West Africa, it's quite common. I've seen that, uh, you know, in one family, there could be one brother could be Muslim, the other could be Christian, and another could be, um, um, basically, believe in the ancestral sort of religion. And they seem to live in you know, quite good harmony in the same family. That's a, that's a gate to what the, one of the Shinto shrines outside Tokyo. So they, um, apparently you, it's, it's called Heavenly Gate. You go through there and you enter heaven. Um, that is an actual Shinto shrine. They're very colorful. Um, so talking about even with the Islam as well, you can see this is in Malaysia. I've seen in Malaysia, um, you know, the women actually wearing hijab and, and everything, and they are dancing on the streets and singing and so on. It's quite common. Or in Pakistan, you know, I haven't seen that, and you can't imagine that. So same religion in different places practiced in different ways because of their um, and the background of the, of the people being, being different historically. So this is something I've written that, you know, I think considering the state of the minorities in, in, in other places, um, this is something I've written about Palestine and Israel, but it's, it basically says that you know, the minorities, you know, people, they are just like us. They have got um, their beliefs, they have got their, their dreams, they have got their children, they have their parents, grandparents. So treat everybody with respect and just you know, accept them as they are. And actually the cultured and the um, uh, countries and uh, progressing countries, they encourage their minorities to flourish and to develop, not punish them and not uh, not uh, discriminate against them. Uh, it should be other way around. So now the de development, how it took place, is really quite amazing now what's happening these days and what happened in the past. Um, and the Stone Age began about, as far as we know, from the stone instrument that, uh, tools that we have found, um, about two point two and a half million years ago. Um, but then after such a long time, about 3,300 years ago, so nearly, you know, two, more than two million years after the Stone Age, Bronze Age developed. So it took huge sort of, you know, 20 million beast locks. It's a huge sort of um, time it took before the Bronze Age developed. And then Iron Age, um, only about, uh, you know, um, uh, 1500, 1700 years ago, uh, after, after the, sorry, after Bronze Age. Um, so it took much harder time. Um, so during the Iron Age, people across much of Europe, Asia, and parts of Africa began making tools and weapons from iron and steel. Uh, unfortunately, they started making weapons from that as well now. Um, 
Uh, I'm saying the Iron Age developed between 1200 BC and 600 BC because it just depends in different countries or different regions. It developed at, at different times. And now you can see how th things are moving so fast. I mean, the vaccine was developed, for example, in less than one year. It used to take, what, 10, 20 years to develop a vaccine. And uh, so things are moving so fast. Um, think, for example, Facebook um, and uh, YouTube, they were only um, invented about 20 years ago, maybe 23 years ago, from 2003 onwards. Um, computers, small computers, they were invented, you know, that long, not a long time ago. Um, so things are moving very fast. Uh, now, coming to the, this is particularly a science museum in London. Um, this is a robot of a baby. And actually, this is a, there's a lot of AI in that, you know, artificial intelligence. And you, this baby reacts to, you know, if you smile, it smiles. If you, um, uh, you know, do something not so good to the baby, you know, baby gets angry or starts crying. So it's just kind of quite interesting how the um, developments are, are taking place now. And this is something, this is 2005 when the robots were not that common in Japan. I went to see uh, uh, Toyota City. Um, and in Toyota sort of a central plant, and they have this uh, um, robot which plays trumpet. And it's actually, it's not a recording, it actually plays a real music. And he has got the lungs, which sort of basically uh, work like human lungs. And um, it can play various types of music. There's even a newscaster, and this is 2014, so it's about eight years ago. There's even a new newscaster in, in, in Japan. Um, so you feed the news in, and uh, she reads the news like a, like a real human. Um, actually, there are, I think, one or two hotels now as well in, in Tokyo, um, which are fully manned by the robots. So receptionist is a robot. They, they look like humans, and they, they act like humans, but they are not really humans, they're robots. Um, so robots are now being used, this is really my field, you know, the robots are now being used for industrial stuff and um, development as well for industry work because a lot of industry work is quite dangerous, people die in industrial accidents and so on. So this is a storage tank inspection and this is a particular robot which has been developed in Japan which, which doesn't, which can stand on its own and it can move in different directions and so on. It can go inside the, the tank and inspect it for corrosion, for oxidation and all type of cracks or damage and so on. So it's not in, like in the past people used to have, used to put scaffoldings, huge scaffoldings go on top of this or go in, in the side as well. Now they have robots um, and these huge tanks sometimes they're full of oil and they had to empty them in the past to inspect them. Now they don't have to do that. They can send the robots which are waterproof, liquid proof and they can go in and do the inspection. So uh, human life is, is, is becomes much safer. Um, and well, but that's a robot. Actually, this is going up sort of inspection of a uh, big boiler in power plants, and they're building you now small sort of drones as well, which can do the industrial work. So scientific development is play, taking place in a um, with a huge stride. There's also somebody developing um, a, uh, a drone which can actually carry human beings, so the human beings can fly. The only problem at the moment is the batteries. Batteries haven't been developed. Uh, to an extent, we can carry <coughs> huge loads, um, but they are being developed. So it's possible that you know, uh, not in too long a time, we'll have the um, batteries which will be able to carry the humans, and humans, humans will be able to fly, you know, like it was their dream in the uh, for a long time. So you know, just to conclude, really, um, I think when you travel the world, you see many faces, races, languages, tongues. Um, so much to learn, so many religions, so many beliefs, and I think that makes the world uh, a very beautiful place. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have any, any questions or anything to, to really... Thank you for the lecture. Um, you didn't talk about the migration out of Africa. Sorry? You didn't talk about the migration out of Africa, which happened something like 70, 80,000 years ago. And the current human population across the globe actually is traced back to that. There's a lot of genetic evidence also. So do you have any idea of um, 
how it all connects together because the fossils that you were indicating, Lucy and others, those were much older, three and three billion, three million years and four million years. Mm -hmm. And this is just uh, 60, 70, 80,000 years ago. When the humans started migrating. Well, I, I didn't really say anything about that because as I said at the start, I'm not an expert and I don't want to go into things where there are a lot of theories about that. Um, you know, they, they were Homo sapiens and then there are Neanderthals. Neanderthals are mainly, you know, they were in the, in, in the European countries. So I think there's a lot of really still um, research going on. I mean, only a few weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, they have found from DNA evidence of another sort of type of uh, human race. And they discovered that in, the, um, in, um, in, in Russia, in, in, in the Siberian sort of um, ice. So there are still a lot of developments taking place. I was discussing with Dr. Mahmoud you know, um, uh, yesterday um, over lunch, and um, I think there, there are loads of other theories. So um, well, the migration took place. I think this is believed sort of, you know, well, that it took place of humans from Africa to, to Europe and to Middle East. Not a question as such, but I would like to remark that uh, uh, you the minorities ke se wo, पाकिस्तान के हालात के ऊपर भी बड़ी सादर आती है दूसरा जो आपके कंक्लूजन था एंड पे कि ये दुनिया बड़ी खूबसूरत है ह्यूमन डेवलपमेंट जो है वो आपके हथियारों की डेवलपमेंट नहीं है आपके टेक्नोलॉजी की डेवलपमेंट नहीं है बल्कि वो डेवलपमेंट है ये कि आप एटम जैसे छोटे से जर्रे को दो हिस्सों में तकसीम करने की बजाय आप अपनी रोटी को तकसीम करें और भूखे को दें यानी आपकी वो कंपैशन है वो आपकी ह्यूमन डेवलपमेंट को का मेरे हिसाब से वो मैयूर होगा हमने इसमें देखा कि आपने तबाकारियों का भी बीच में जिक्र आया फिर आखिर में साइंस म्यूजियम भी आया तो आप का इस पूरा जो सफर है जो आपने म्यूजियम्स को ऑब्जर्व किया और हिस्ट्री को आपने देखा आपके ख्याल में आज हम बेहतर जगह पे खड़े हैं या हम जवाल का शिकार हैं दुनिया अभी बेहतर है या बेहतरी की तरफ जाने का इसमें कितना इम्कान है डिस्पाइट ऑल जो जितनी भी मायूसियाँ हैं जगह जतल है मैं चूँकि जवान नस्ल से ताल्लुक रखता हूँ तो मैं क्या समझूँ कि आगे जो है बेहतरी हो रही है या नहीं बस एक रैंडम सफेदेंट um uh, the white house and you know the, the the government buildings will be invaded by the masses in in usa um so i think it's a that's a difficult question i i was talking just about the human nature and what the humans are like that they love to collaborate they love to sit together exchange ideas like we are doing here but they also like to dominate and i was talking about the america but that's not really um um it doesn't just apply to America. Any, a lot of countries have become powerful. Um, you know, Egyptians did that, Greeks did that, Romans did that. They conquered other countries. And, but we are becoming more knowledgeable, we are becoming more uh, educated. And uh, some countries are, at least, you know. Uh, in the UK, I suppose we have better hope because, you know, now the minorities are treated, uh, you know, much better than, say, 20, 30, 50 years ago. Uh, a Hindu can now become prime minister, but I think 20 years ago that would not have been possible. Um, so the thoughts are, are getting better, but at the same time, you know, we are getting involved. I don't know, um, Dr. Perez, if, if you have anything, you can contribute to that. It's a very difficult question. We, we, are, we are here to listen to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I have been inspired by your articles in the dawn, actually, so I think that is very, very nice that we... You know, there are a lot of people I've, you know, I've seen who, who, because obviously the Dawn newspaper goes to, you know, many places and many people and so on. So people are, you know, are encouraged that we have um, progressive ideas in Pakistan as well. It's not all about, uh, uh, you know, it's not all one-way traffic. So, so that is, and, and this particular place is evidence of that, that, uh, uh, you know, there are pe people got together and, uh, and, um, you know, new seeds are sown, if you like, you know, and uh, um, and uh, things 
can get better, at least in some parts of the society, it's not all doom and gloom. جو ہسٹری لیسنس ہیں وہ بھی ہمیں یہی بتا رہے ہیں کہ ایک دوسرے کا خیال رکھ کے ڈومینیٹ ہونے کی بجائے کمپیشن اور ہارمنی کے ساتھ چلیں تو یہ دنیا ہم سب کے لیے بہت اچھی رہنے کی جگہ آئی فائنڈ ویری بیوٹیفل پیپل ڈفرینٹ بلیوز دیو ڈفرینٹ ڈفرینٹ کسٹمز ڈفرینٹ لینگویز یو نو وین آئی گو ٹو فار ایسٹ فار ایگزامپل یو نو دس سو مین ڈفرینٹ ٹائپس آف پیپل اینڈ سو فرام یوروپ اینڈ یو نو دیٹ میکس ورڈ ویری بیوٹیفل If they're all white or all brown people, you know, or just one religion, um, the world would have been, I don't know, from my, my viewpoint, it would have been a bit boring, really. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting. Thank you.